All right, guys, welcome back to Chasing Rabbits. You know, we had this box out in the classroom, and I got all kinds of fun and interesting questions. And today, your rabbit that you want to chase, I'm going to chase this one. Let's see what it says. Will we talk about when Japan almost became a Christian empire? <laughs> all right, <laughs> let's go. So, yeah, I spoke to the young man who, who presented this question, and they were dialoguing with a video from Alternate History Hub. Fascinating video, uh, speculative history. And I kind of went down that rabbit hole, and because uh, I, I as, as much as, or as little as I have studied uh, Christian history, I've, I've studied some, I was not aware of this story. So uh, I did, did a little bit of homework there. Um, I found a helpful video, if anybody's interested in it, it's on YouTube um, from the BBC. There's this whole uh, tradition of hidden Christians that, that were in Japan after the persecution happened. If you're a history buff, check it out. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. This is a really interesting intersection for me. Uh, so I want to kind of back out, zoom out a little bit, and kind of reframe the pursuit. Because, yeah, that, it's interesting when, when a, a nation, um, a, a, a group of people kind of adopt a faith there can be some challenges, there can be some opportunities, but it made me pose this question in response to that question. So I hope a uh, student who asked this, that this is a helpful exploration, but uh, let's try this out. Why do some nations claim to be Christian nations? So what, what I'm referring to here is called a Christian state. You can check this out on Wikipedia. There's a list of states that have had a history uh, kind of adopting it as a national religion. So, yeah, did that, uh, what, what would have happened if, if, if Japan had become a Christian nation? That speculative video, very intriguing. And there was a, a history there that, that Japan had early exposure to Christianity um, uh, through colonial exploits and all that kind of thing. So really interesting topic. When we think of Christian nation here in the U.S., we probably are surrounded by a lot of like national storytelling, uh, a, a kind of a national myth or a mythos, this, this kind of approach to understanding, um, you know, the, the United States, like somehow unique role as a Christian nation, which just isn't isn't really historical. So I actually want to dive into this question because yes, just as it was surprising to me uh, and to the student that Japan almost became a Christian nation um, early on, um, we can go really far back into Christian history. So I want to kind of change the image a little bit on what we consider a Christian nation. Or maybe let's just maybe for our American audience here, that we realize that a lot of a lot of nations have adopted the faith uh, well before us, so we don't own uh, we don't corner this market, right? <laughs> so uh, let's 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 check this out. In the second century, there was a kingdom called Edessa, and there was a king named Agbar the Ninth, and this was about 180 A.D. So you're talking second century. This is super early. There's some really really interesting uh, research done on this uh, kingdom. Allegedly, this this uh, king actually had conversations with Jesus. That's what some of the apocryphal sources say. But at any rate. You have as early as the second century, um, whether or not that, that account of him actually having uh, letters back and forth between him and Jesus, whether or not that's true, it, it, it's verified that, you know, as early as the second century, you had a Christian king adopting the faith, representing his kingdom, um, which is something we'll explore later. Can a, can a, a nation collectively decide to follow a faith? And what does that mean for their uh, their relationship with Jesus? Is it intimate? Is it personal? Or is it just something you're born into? So we'll examine that in a moment. All right, fourth century Armenia, right? There was a guy named Tiradides III. Really fascinating story about a guy named Tiradides. 
I think I'm saying that right. And he was in Armenia, and he was originally hostile to the faith. He, uh, Zoroastrianism is a, is a faith that was kind of in that area, uh, in that in that direction east of east of Jerusalem. And and, and there was uh, some Christians that he like imprisoned and 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 uh, wanted to marry one of them, and they refused, and he had everybody killed. And there was one still left in prison, and. Um, this this uh, this king kind of went crazy and 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 needed to be cured of his kind of crazy illness. Like a legend says that he was acting like a boar running around in the woods, and like something like thirteen years later, he returns to that that uh, that pr- pr- imprisoned Christian and 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 hears that he can heal him, and he does, and then he accepts the faith. So I, you know, how much of this is coded in 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 legend or myth? I I, I don't know, but but Ar- Armenia in the fourth century. It became the uh, allegedly the, the first nominally Christian state. Uh, just think about that. So we had our, our King Agbar of, of Edessa becoming a Christian. So kind of um, that had to have some influence. But here um, uh, the Armenian king deciding, hey, we're a Christian state now in 300 and this is before constantine right so fascinating we'll get back to constantine in a minute who's around the same time period um but there's another uh christian kingdom that crops up this one is uh maybe you haven't heard of this one axum right so we're we're looking at tigray we're looking at ethiopia we're talking about this area over here um and the, ethiopia had a long history of christianity um, remember the Ethiopian eunuch um, become a con- convert, and and there's this continuous history of of Ethiopian Christianity for a long time. This came named Izana from Axum, a nearby kingdom. There had already been Christian missionary activity in the area, but when Izana became uh, a Christian, he accepted Christianity. Um, he uh, declared it uh, the official religion of Axum. We have all of these like ethnic groups that have claimed Christian kingdom, um, these Christian nations that were well around before, uh, well around before America. So uh, maybe this is helping you kind of like peel back some of the myth of how we sometimes narrate our own story. Um, But yeah, let's keep going. Uh, we hit fast forward. We go a little further west, a little a little closer to home, right? Um, we're talking about Iceland in the 10th century. Now, this one's fascinating. I actually had the opportunity to go to the place where where this uh, this episode that I'm about to talk about happened um, here in Iceland. Uh, man, it was super cool to be to be where this stuff took place. Uh, we saw the first uh, Icelandic baptismal pool. Um, so. At any rate, Iceland became a uh, adopted Christianity as a nation, kind of pressured by a Danish king who who wanted to impose Christianity upon the Icelandic pagans, and it was kind of a split council. They drew together um, the chieftains of Iceland, um, and and some of them were pagan and some of them were Christian, and they appointed a well trusted uh, uh, pagan. Uh, chieftain kind of to mediate the decision his name was Thorgir and man I don't know if I'm saying this right let's try this out Thorgir Thorkelsen I'm sure I butchered that I am I really apologize Icelandic folks um for butchering that but really interesting story while they're having this deliberation there's like a volcano that kind of like leaks some lava and destroys one of the nearby um pagan houses and they're like see the gods are mad at us and 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 Thorgir he he's like well uh you know who who angered the gods when the the ground that we were on um was formed by lava so he, he kind of had this this interesting perspective goes to sleep has a dream wakes up and and he is this influential voice that everybody trusted that uh that said you know what we we should accept christianity and he and he and and he and the council representing the nation um declared iceland uh, a christian nation that happened in the year 1000 so oh man what a great question we've been launched into about J- japan possibly coming a christian empire if you want to check out that video that we were referencing earlier it, it, the, the history there is the first part and then it goes into that speculative history um and then that BBC documentary covers some of the same material. So if you're interested in that. So we, we've learned about a few new kingdoms today. One that almost became a Christian nation and, and four that did. Dating all the way back from the 2nd century all the way into the 10th century. Not to mention um, we have Constantine, which we'll get into in a minute. But, but this is something... 
that raises a big question for us um, that I think it's it's okay to problematize this if you're scratching your head like, okay, these kings, they became to faith, but does that count for everybody or these chieftains decided or this influential figure? Does that mean that the whole people group like by de facto become Christian? So you might be asking, but is conversion by nationality a problem? Well, let's examine that. I, I actually want to present the counter narrative, right? So we're, this is, uh, you know, we're hearing history from the victors, if you will, right? <laughs> we're, we're hearing uh, the way that they chewed on how they became and kind of celebrated their their faith um, through these kind of often myth- mythologized or, or um, a little legendary kind of tales of these kings that, yes, are, are rooted in historical truth, but are kind of glossed over and kind of glamorized, um, as we'll see with Constantine in a moment. But let's hear from someone on the other side of that narrative. So uh, one of my uh, uh, influential uh, voices in my life, the late Richard Twiss, I think it's worth hearing how he saw the missionary efforts of the European colonizers who came to uh, Turtle Island, a.k.a. what we call the U.S., and how the indigenous people um, were not seen as a, as a mission field, were not seen as possible converts to the faith, but overall were seen as a problem to remove. And so there's this insidious thing that happens when a nation and an, uh, um, accepts a faith and then uh, generations later you assume by virtue of your ethnicity that you belong to uh, uh, covenant people and that people outside of your ethnicity do not and the kind of narrative adjustments and selective Bible reading that would enable uh, a missiology that we might call like manifest destiny. Um, kind of misappropriating the story of Israel and really making a mess of what it would mean to be a Christian nation. So let's hear from Richard Twiss. So here we are 400 years, 500 years into the, the American experiment. And even with guys like William Penn, the great Pennsylvania experiment, of coming to uh, America, European peoples, to build a nation, as it were, built on certain biblical ideologies and a sense of chosenness, a sense of uh, God sending them, God leading them, fleeing Europe, persecution, etc. Coming here to establish the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And, And coming with that sense of chosenness from the narrative of, of what they experienced, sort of that Exodus narrative, escaping persecution, escaping Egypt as it were, coming to the promised land and finding us, the native people, who in that metaphor became their Canaanites. So we stood in the way of them occupying the land of milk and honey. And so here we have 400 years now of uh, colonialism and uh, colonization, but the unique American brand of Uh, colonialism had embedded with it a biblical narrative of chosenness and sovereignty uh, so that the the theology of American expansionism is is manifest destiny. So in that that sort of myth, the myth of, of manifest destiny, it made us as native people an obstacle to be overcome in order for them to build the kingdom of heaven. Here in America. So if you read all those early speeches of the quote unquote founding fathers, uh, there's continual ongoing references to God, the Bible, chosenness. And so here we are now, a couple centuries into that, and today the host people of the land, uh, we have the highest incidence of unemployment and poverty. Uh, we have the highest incident of teen suicide in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, we have the highest incidence of diabetes, tuberculosis per prison, uh, uh, highest prison population per capita, and uh, lowest uh, life expectancies. And yet we live as tiny islands in the most prosperous, uh, military, powerful nation in the history of the world. And yet on some of the reservations in North America, it's still third world-like conditions. So a lot of this thinking, if we really trace its roots, this thinking of 
a particular group or ethnic group or uh, a nation becoming Christian, uh, we can really trace to the the church historian Eusebius. And he was writing around some of the time that some of this was happening we've reviewed already, but um, on behalf of Constantine, the the Roman emperor, right, from, you know, think of Constantinople, the eastern part of Rome. And he adopted Christianity as a means of, of uh, he thought it was a, a way to win uh, victory, he, conquer by this. This is a translation of Eusebius's kind of propagandistic view of 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 Constantine's reign and how the faith kind of um, became a national rallying cry a banner under which to fight um, is the cross something that a nation should use to conquer by um, well, let's just take a look at how Eusebius is chewing on this and I if you feel uncomfortable, you cringe at all, just note that. But let's read from Eusebius, a church historian, kind of talking about Constantine's conversion and how that affected the nation. And while he, this is talking about Constantine, was thus praying with fervent entreaty, a most marvelous sign appeared to him from heaven, the account of which it might have been hard to believe had it been related by any other person. But since the victorious emperor himself long afterwards declared it to the writer of this history, when he was honored with his acquaintance in society and confirmed his statement by an oath, who could hesitate to accredit the relation, especially since the testimony of after time has been established its truth. He said, at about noon, when the day was already beginning to decline, he saw with his own eyes the trophy of a cross of light in the heavens above the sun and bearing the inscription, Conquer by this. Thus, the emperor in all his actions honored God, the controller of all things, and exercised the unwearied oversight of his churches. And God requited him by subduing all barbarous nations under his feet, so that he was able everywhere to raise trophies over his enemies. And he proclaimed him as conqueror to all humankind, and made him a terror to all his adversaries. Not indeed that that was his natural character, since he was rather the meekest, the gentlest, and most benevolent of men. Is anybody a little like, what is going on here? So hold on, Constantine's conversion came at the, the uh, as, as he tells the story, and you can hear Eusebius kind of like, I know no one's going to believe me, maybe I don't either, but the, the emperor said it, that, that uh, you know, he saw this vision of a cross conquered by this, and that, that gives him permission to, to, to put under his feet all barbarous nations, can we see the threads of these problematic elements of associating um, your faith with nationality or your faith with ethnicity um, and, and then wielding the power of the state in order to uh, allegedly carry out the means of God? Is that what Jesus came to set up with his group of poor fishermen, um, his, his tax collector zealot, these guys that were following him, these um uh, so, some of these uh, illiterate Jews and the, and the people that were surprised that they had no edu education. Is this really the fruit of, of Jesus's like message, like who the church was, these persecuted people, the, these women, these slaves, all of this, the, the, the huge growth of the early church and the marginalized people that made up that church? Um, is this where this goes, that what they need to do to carry out the mission of God is to pick up national power and subdue other nations? Is this really the the missiological aims of god is this is this it oh man one of the most prophetic voices on on this is the writings of uh, mark charles and sung chan ra who wrote a book called um uh, unsettling truths, and uh, it talks about this this problem and and, and how we need to, to chew on it and how it shaped um, our approach to missions in the U.S. and et cetera, et cetera. So let me just read from their critique of Eusebius and this what we would call the heresy of Christian empire. So here we go. The idea of Christendom, an earthly Christian empire, is an extra biblical concept that is not aligned with the teachings of Jesus. A convert to Christianity would join a community of believers as an act of submission to the kingdom of God, knowing full well that their conversion would result in carrying a cross. With the advent of Christendom under Constantine, admission into the kingdom became entangled with participation in protection from an earthly empire. Instead of joining the church intentionally, sacrificially, and in opposition 
to empire, membership in the church now depended upon citizenship in and allegiance to one of the most powerful and historically oppressive empires in the world. He's referring here to the Roman Empire that Constantine uh, was at the helm of. So do you see the issue that there's something reframed in the understanding of what it means to be a Christian. And so to, to answer the rephrased question, why do some nations refer to themselves as Christian nations? I would argue that that category, um, maybe while it serves as a demographic qualifier or understanding how a particular set of beliefs shaped a history, I'm not sure that nations, if you will, can be Christian. I, I think the kingdom of God is an alternative kingdom. And it does not need access to power uh, because it has all the access to power to God um, through the Spirit in Christ. So, yeah, I, I'm super fascinated with this problem over the course of history. And I'm really intrigued that this played out to some degree even in Japan. And I'm grateful for the student that asked this question to send us down that rabbit hole. And I want you, uh, listener, uh, youth who are asking these tough questions to examine these things. What is the difference between an earthly kingdom and the kingdom of God? How is our citizenship in the kingdom of God different than our citizenship to an earthly kingdom? So maybe if we problematize a little bit of the myth and the legend and the storytelling that this, this thought of the heresy of Christian empire, if, if we examine and critique those particular nuances of history, perhaps we stand a chance to be transformed by voices of the marginalized, say like the indigenous, say like Richard Twiss, uh, like Mark Charles, uh, or the immigrants who have been on the, the, the tail end of some of these national disputes. Um, Sung Chan Ra, he's a Korean immigrant. So I hope this exploration has been helpful in naming some of the challenges, some of the perspectives, and some of the history that shapes us today. And as we examine these things, I think listening to the global voices, listening to Christians who have not had access to, to imperial power, I, I think we can better assess and understand our relationship to the kingdom of God in the places we're in. And perhaps, I, I believe out of doing that, we can actually reach people with with the mission of God in a clearer a more Jesus centric way let's model Jesus more than we model Constantine all right well I hope this has been helpful we'll see you next time on chasing rabbits